What's going on smart people? Bringing you another episode of Tensor Calculus for Physics. In a few videos, we're going to be motivating the Einstein field equations. And in order to minimize the amount of work we have to do in that video, over the next two videos, we'll be exploring sort of what that stuff should reduce to and what could it possibly be in terms of in the first place. That way in the final video, it'll amount to just finding coefficients, which will be pretty easy. So for this video, we're going to be learning how to relate the metric tensor to the gravitational potential in the Newtonian limit. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing is uh, we have the regular classical equations of motion, which is Poisson's equation. We have the Laplacian of the gravitational potential is equal to 4 pi big G times rho. This is eventually what the Einstein field equation should reduce to. And the right-hand side is, is pretty easy to, to generalize. All of the work is going to be in the left-hand side. Because we already know, uh, or at least it's been established before this stuff, that the energy momentum tensor, T mu nu, the zero, zero component is related to the Hamiltonian density. In other words, the energy density. So if we have something that's not moving, the energy is just its mass density, E equals mc squared. So in a classical limit, this guy will end up being replaced with the regular mass density. There's nothing really crazy happening there. The left-hand side, though, is different. How do we generalize this uh, potential and this Laplacian? I think we already know that the derivative should be replaced with covariant derivatives, but what's up with the, with the potential? That's what we're going to be looking at today. So in episode 9, we talked about the geodesic equation. We actually derived it, which is the generalization of like the free fall equation. We have d squared, the second derivative of the four position with respect to proper time, plus the contraction of the Christoffel symbols with the four velocities, v mu, v nu, is equal to zero. Uh, if the Christoffel symbols vanish, if we're in a locally Minkowski spot and we choose our coordinates such that the metric is just the uh, Minkowski metric, eta, uh, then that term vanishes and we just get that the second derivative with respect to proper time is zero. We have something that's moving with constant velocity. So this is the generalized version of this equation here. We have d squared xi dt squared minus the acceleration is equal to zero. That's the classical version. So we want to show how we can uh, reduce how these two are really truly related. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the four velocity. The four velocity is defined by gamma uh, one and the regular velocity in units where c is equal to one. If we're not using units where c is equal to one, it's just gamma c v. Okay, this just allows us in natural units to specify velocities in units of the speed of light. So it's easier to talk about what a small velocity is, I think. So if we do take a, a classical Newtonian limit where the velocity is much smaller than the speed of light and perhaps is even negligible, well then the velocity term is zero and gamma is just one because gamma is equal to one over the square root of one minus V squared, again in natural units. So the four velocity, just becomes one and the zero vector, okay? Uh, that means that when we contract this guy, when we contract these four velocities with the Christoffel symbols, for mu nu equal to anything but zero, it's just gonna be multiplying by zero, right? Because the i components of the four velocity are all zero. It's only the zero component that matters. So we only get contributions for mu nu equal to zero, zero. So that simplifies things quite a bit already. Um, if you let it be a little bit non-zero, then you just have smaller contributions to the total sum. But if it's, but then if you're multiplying them together, then you get small squared, which is still small, or even smaller. Okay, so the next thing that I wanna do is I want to write out, so it looks like gamma lambda zero zero is the only term for the Christoffel symbols that matters. So what are the Christoffel symbols? Well, I'll remind us, it's gamma lambda mu nu is equal to one half G 
Upstairs has to have a lambda, and then an index being summed over, I'll call it alpha. And the way that I remember the form of the Christoffel symbols is the minus sign gets the mu nu with the metric. If the metric is mu nu rather than other indices, that term gets a minus sign. So this will be d mu g alpha nu plus d nu g mu alpha minus the term where g gets both mu nu, d alpha g mu nu. Okay. Now to actually calculate this guy in a Newtonian limit, we have to impose some form of metric, right? So we're going to be using what's referred to as the static weak field metric. So the static weak field metric. Static means that the metric doesn't evolve over time, and weak field means it's almost Minkowski plus a small perturbation. And when I say Minkowski, I'll be referring to that with this eta. We'll say eta alpha beta is just equal to a diagonal of uh, one minus one minus one minus one. Okay, so it's just your regular Minkowski metric. So for the static weak field, the general metric tensor is just the Minkowski, which is constant, plus a small perturbation, H alpha beta, which in general will depend on the position. And the same thing goes here. I'm putting a little arrow on top of the X to let us know that it depends on the position in space, not in time. Okay, so now we're interested in gamma lambda zero zero, which is equal to, well, if we're saying mu nu is equal to zero, then that means that these first two terms are just time derivatives of the metric. And we said in the beginning, or just a mi minute ago, that this is static, it doesn't depend on time. So these first two terms are zero, leaving only this final term, which we're summing over all of the contributions. So it's gonna be equal to minus one half uh, g lambda alpha, d alpha g mu nu or and um, so if we're taking the derivative if we're summing over the derivatives of uh, this metric well the first term is constant so when we're taking derivatives this eta this uh, Minkowski metric tensor vanishes meaning that we're only taking the derivative of this h term this perturbation term so I'll write this as uh, h zero zero because mu nu is zero zero. Okay, and then we are contracting this derivative term with the metric tensor, which just acts as raising the index. So this is just minus one half uh, d lambda h zero zero. So the indices on the left hand side match the indices on the right hand side. Next I'm going to be less careful about using the right index notation. We're already going to be losing general covariance and taking a Newtonian limit anyways. So I just want to relate this derivative term to the regular gradient term um, by recalling how these derivatives are related. Additionally, in addition to that, we're summing or we're having these lambda terms that we can choose However, what would the zero, lambda equal to zero term be? It would be zero because our metric doesn't depend on time. That would be a time derivative. So in this limit, we're really only getting contributions for the i components, one, two, three, not the zero components. Minus one half di h zero zero. Okay, and if we want to I'm not lowering the index, I just want to express this derivative. How is that related to the lower index derivative? Yes, it's by applying the metric tensor, but I'm just, that's if I wanted to lower the index. But if I'm just looking component by component, how do they vary? Well, for a regular Minkowski metric, they would be just negatives of each other, right? But that's not what we have. We have Minkowski plus a small perturbation. However, if we distribute that to it, so if we take, say, g uh, i j d j, that would be equal to 
uh, acting on the metric H00, that would be equal to eta ij plus h i j d j h zero zero but if we include this term we're going to second order in the perturbation we've already said the perturbation is small so if we included second order in h that would be negligible okay so we're saying h is just large enough to include h squared is negligible it's second order in the perturbation which means we can write this approximately as still just the Minkowski metric acting on the derivative, which its act is just switching the sign of the derivative. So I can write this as one half dj, or oops, I should keep my index, because we're doing component by component, di h00, which is just the gradient. Okay, so I'm not lowering the index, I'm just comparing the, the component by components here. I know that the notation is a bit weird though. Okay, so now the last thing that I want to do is we're, eventually, we're about to substitute this into the geodesic equation, but before we do that, let's notice that in the geodesic equation we have derivatives with respect to proper time. Uh, but how does that relate to regular time? Well, we know that if we have a function df d tau, that's equal to df dt dt d tau, using chain rule. And in a previous video, if we take that uh, d tau squared is equal to dt squared, oops, dt squared minus dx squared, we can form these ratios, which will give us that ddt, dt d tau is just gamma. Um, yeah, and since we're in the classical limit, gamma is approximately equal to 1 because the velocity is very small, which is about 1. So, I mean, that's not surprising. Time is roughly the same in all frames if you're constricting yourself to frames where velocities are moving very small with respect to the speed of light. So under this limit, we can replace dd taus with ddts. So this gives us, for the geodesic equation, in the Newtonian limit that dxi dt squared uh, minus, minus, no, plus um, one half the gradient of the perturbation is equal to zero. I think I set c equal to one, right? The only difference would be if I didn't set c equal to 1, then there would be an additional factor of c squareds here, right? Because if I'm taking uh, the 0, 0 component of the 4 velocity is technically c times gamma, but if we're using units where c is equal to 1, then these terms identically are just equal to 1 for mu nu equal to 0. Okay? So if you replace or reinsert factors of c, there would be a c squared here as well. Okay, and if we take a look at classically, we have that the second derivative of the position with respect to time minus the acceleration is equal to zero, which allows us to identify one half the gradient of this perturbation is equal to minus g. And now we're, we're just getting there. We also know that from Newton's second law, the force is equal to mass times the acceleration, which is equal to the minus gradient of the gravitational potential, not potential energy, times mass. So identifying both terms here, we see that G is equal to minus the gradient of the potential. And since minus G is equal to one half the gradient of the perturbation, we get that uh, one half the gradient of the, whoops, one half the gradient of the perturbation is equal to the gradient of phi. Identifying both terms, we get that now uh, these two terms are actually proportional to each other. The perturbation, h0, 0, 0 
is just equal to 2 phi. Okay. Substituting this back into our definition for the weak field metric, we have G00 zero, zero, and say the Newtonian limit is equal to eta 0, 0 plus h 0, 0. The 0th component uh, for this metric signature, which is mostly minus, is the 0, 0 component is 1. So this is equal to 1 plus 2 phi. So in the Newtonian limit, this is how the 0, 0 component of the metric tensor can be related to a gravitational potential. And actually, it shouldn't be all that surprising that it's the zero, zero component if you're familiar with what the energy momentum tensor is. With the energy momentum tensor, T mu nu, the zero, zero component, T zero, zero, is related to the Hamiltonian density, which is like the total energy density. And if something isn't moving, then it doesn't have kinetic energy, it only has the energy associated with its mass. So for something roughly at rest, h over c squared just gives you the mass density. And if we look up here, so that's the zero, zero component of the energy momentum tensor. And if we are trying to relate both sides of the equation, if the right-hand side is related to the zero, zero component of the tensor, then so should the left-hand side. So it's not, over, it's not incredibly surprising that the gravitational potential ends up being related to the zero, zero component of the metric tensor. And if we take the Laplacian of both sides, del squared g00 Newtonian, the Minkowski metric being constant, we get that it's equal to the Laplacian of this term. The Laplacian of one is constant, so we get that it's equal to the Laplacian of two times phi. And we already know what the Laplacian is for this. It's equal to Poisson's equation. So that's just gonna be equal to eight pi, because it's two phi, g rho. Okay, so in a heuristic manner, we can kind of say that the generalization of this stuff should reduce to, if we want to keep it in tensor language, that del squared of G00 in the Newtonian limit should be equal to 8 pi G times T00, zero, 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 zero component of the energy momentum tensor. If we insert appropriate factors of C, then we would get a 1 over c squared term um, from this guy here. And then we would also get a 1 over c squared term from relating the energy to a mass. We would have to divide by a c squared. So if we inserted proper units of c squared, we would get that this divergence squared of g00 in the Newtonian limit is equal to 8 pi g over c to the fourth t00. I guess Newtonian limit, why not? Um, so right there, we're getting a massive hint at what Einstein's field equations could generalize to. The right-hand side will end up generalizing to something like the energy momentum tensor, and the left-hand side should be in terms of second derivatives of the metric. However, it won't be second covariant derivatives of the metric because the covariant derivative d mu g alpha beta is defined to be zero. We chose connection coefficients so that this always happens. Your ruler isn't changing with respect to the ruler. So the derivatives will be in terms of second derivatives of the metric, but in the next video we'll describe or we'll try to shed some light on what our options actually are. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comment section if you did, and I'll see you guys there.